glad to see we're bringing in the A-team for preaching today. And uh, so looking forward to this time of worship, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, welcome. Welcome to worship. Uh, thanks for that uh, introduction, President Hill. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll take that and run with it, okay? <laughs> I'm glad that y'all are all here uh, for this third week of um, coming up on the third week of Easter. Now, I do want to take a minute before we begin worship uh, to thank two of our students and who both happen to be in one of my classes this semester. Uh, Cheryl Farr has prepared the pre-recorded music for the two hymns that we'll be singing. And you'll see those words on the on the bulletin um, when Claire uh, puts them up on the screen. We won't try to sing those together, but I encourage you at home to sing them along with uh, the words. They are uh, appropriate hymns for the text for today. And um, though they may not be completely familiar to all of you. And then I want to thank uh, Alicia Payne who will be reading our scripture for us this morning. Alicia, thank you, and Cheryl, thank you. And once again, I welcome all of you to worship. Let's take a moment as the bulletin comes up, the order of worship, uh, to begin with prayer, and then um, a, a moment of silence, and then I'll call us out with our call to worship. Uh, join, join with me as we pray and worship together. Friends, Christ draws close to us. His presence is not announced so much by searing light or angelic song as it is by the gradual recognition of something holy enmeshed in our daily lives, simple as salt, common as bread, as unexpected as a treasure buried in a field. Such is the presence of Christ with us in each ordinary day. Let us therefore praise God with joy. Amen.
Let us pray together. Almighty God, you give us the joy of celebrating our Lord's resurrection. Give us also the joys of life in your service and bring us at last to the full joy of life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we'll hear the gospel reading from Ali, uh, by Alicia. Thank you. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And I just read for you all Luke 24, 13 through 35. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, we uh, normally call this story the road to Emmaus. But what those disciples are really on is the road of heartbreak. They are grieving. Jesus, the one they loved and dared to believe was the Savior, has been crucified like a common criminal. Now, the shock and confusion following Jesus' death fogs them. It's grief these two disciples are feeling as they walk towards the little town of Emmaus, seven miles away, from the horror scene of Jerusalem. And they are walking back, I imagine, to life as they had known it before Jesus. You know, back to taxes and doom scrolling on the internet, back to lackluster jobs where others tell them how to live their humdrum lives and to what possible end. The road they are walking is called heartbreak. You see, Pilate and Caiaphas and all their power-hungry cronies have done their job well. They have smashed the hopes that rested on Jesus' shoulders. And with their vast weapons of terror and control, they have incited mobs, incited mobs to do their bidding. They have brutalized a budding liberation movement whose leader went around doing nothing more than healing the sick and teaching nonsense like blessed are the poor 
and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Just a peasant from the backwaters of Galilee who speaks in riddles and who disrupts the pocket lining temple banking system of the powerful. They nailed him good, but dead. And Jesus' followers, all but a few brave and loving women, are plodding back to wherever they came from. Then, remember the story, y'all? Remember the story? Then into the fog that surrounds those disciples, a stranger appears. He talks with them about their very own scriptures, about Moses and Elijah and Zechariah. Cleopas and the other disciple are intrigued. At least they think he's a diversion. So they say to him, come on and eat with us, they say. No, 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 I couldn't do that. Well, yeah, come on, have some supper. Did I mention to you that they were from the South? Come on, eat with us. All right, if you insist. And then the stranger takes bread. He blesses it. He breaks it, and he shares it with those at the table. And then their hearts begin to burn within them. And then their eyes are opened. They see, they see he is the risen Christ alive among them. It's the bread, you see. It's the meal that Jesus blesses and breaks and shares with them, just as he had done at the Last Supper, just as he had done at the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And when he breaks and gives the disciples the bread, they know who he is. It's the bread. Now, I guess you all have heard that all during this past tough 14 months, all over the world during this global pandemic, people when our schools and seminaries and jobs and normal ways of life have been shut down all over the world, people have been baking bread like never before. In their own kitchens, mothers and fathers and couples and friends and children and individuals have been baking bread and then sharing it with their neighbors. Why do you think we've been doing this? Maybe because in the middle of heartbreak, in the middle of fearful and changing times, we remember what is most basic, and we reach for what sustains ourselves, body, and spirit, like fresh baked bread pulled from the oven, smelling like the good earth. And nothing like that smell of walking into a bakery or into a kitchen where bread is baking. And when we break it, we know what matters, the goodness of life, of friendship, of love, of care for the stranger, the goodness of God's creation. Have you ever thought about it? It's interesting. The word companionship, companionship, in its Latin origins, it means with bread, companis. We enjoy true companionship when we, as the old song goes, break bread together. Jesus companions the disciples on the heartbreak road, and when he breaks the bread, they know Jesus for who he truly is, the risen Lord. With you, the poet Conrad Aiken says, bread is more than bread, and wine is more than wine. With you, bread is more than bread, and wine is more than wine. And right then and there is the bread of life. Jesus starts mending the holes in their broken hearts. And right then and there, Jesus starts remembering, remembering the broken community of wounded followers. Like a church that has been scattered and frustrated and full of chaos and loss and fear over the past 14 months, we now find ourselves slowly moving being remembered into the body. And we long for the day. I was just talking with Mitzi Minor a few minutes ago. We long for the day whenever we can actually worship together again in body and in spirit. And Jesus is there enlisting us in the resurrection movement, propelled by the power of love. It's a resurrection movement that's already at hand that proclaims 
release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, a movement that proclaims that this year, the year of the pandemic, 2020 and 2021 is still despite appearances, the acceptable year of the Lord. Now we call that resurrection, folks. And the bright side, if there is one, of this very dark chapter that the world is going through and is yearning to break free from is the possibility, the promise of new life that has always been present since Jesus rose from the dead on that first great getting up morning, but that we are often too tamped down in our daily grinds and in our grief and fear to truly see. What the disciples see on the road to heartbreak is new life in Christ, risen all around. So what about us? What about you? What about me? God does companion us through Christ and walks with us towards a new future. And as we walk, God may very well be asking us, how do we really want to live? Do we want to stay in the dark, dank tombs with our eyes closed to the true riches of life? Do we want to succumb once again to the ho-hum? Or do we want to live abundantly with the risen Lord by our side? Do we want to cave to the craven powers that plunder and pollute and deceive and destroy? Or do we want to rise up with the risen Lord who is already on the resurrection road? I was at a worship service a while back before the pandemic a small congregation in San Antonio, where before sharing in Holy Communion, the pastor invited testimonies. It was that kind of a Sunday. A man stood up and said, I need to confess. There is so much trouble around here, he said. Young kids are being unlawfully detained in horrid conditions in our own state. Another mass shooting has happened in Colorado, and I hear preachers, he said, in our own city and politicians in Washington spewing hatred and outright power mongering that makes me want to denounce my faith. I just want to say, the man said, that I don't know how much more of this I can take. Then he sat down. Dead silence was in that little sanctuary all around. No one moved. Then a man deliberately, slowly in the choir stood up and he said, take heart, my brother. Remember, we live on this side of the resurrection. The evil vermin of the earth are already defeated. They are scurrying for their holes. They cannot hide. Jesus is risen. The powers of death are already broken. We, you, and me, and everybody else sitting around this place, we're the mop-up operation. Christ is risen, he said. Believe it. Then the leader of the worship service, she stood up, and she went to the table, and she took bread, she blessed it, and she broke it, and she gave it to all those fearfully brave, fearfully brave Christians. So today, tomorrow, as you sit at the table with friends or family members who companion you on the road of life, when you are able once again to gather safely with your congregations, like some of us are beginning to be able to do or to greet a stranger with compassion, when you say, pass the bread, please, remember, remember, Jesus, the Lord of life, is the conqueror of death, and he is known in the bread broken, blessed, and shared. Jesus, our risen companion, is with us. Why? He's all around us right now in the middle of a pandemic. Jesus is all around us, baking up a fresh batch of new life. Who would have thought it? Is your heart burning? 
are you beginning to see that bread shared is always more than bread? Bread shared is always more than bread. So be it, my brothers and sisters, so be it. I want to invite you now, if you would like, to unmute yourself. Um, I'll give you just a minute. Claire will fix that for us so that you can unmute yourself. And join with me in the prayer that she's going to put up on the screen. Uh, it's going to be a bit cacophonous as we all try to pray this long communion prayer together. But I want to invite us to do that uh, as Christ's body gathered today in this most unusual way around the table that has been set by Memphis Theological Seminary. And so uh, join with me together as we pray, and the echoes that we share will be the echoes of our yearning for one another and our yearning for Christ's presence among us. Oh God, just as the disciples heard Christ's words of promise and began to eat the bread and drink the wine in the suffering of a long remembrance and in the joy of a hope. Grant that we may be spoken in each page of everyday affairs. Coffee on our table in the morning. A simple gesture of opening a door to go out on the feet. Shouts of children in the parks. A familiar song sung by an unfamiliar voice. A friendly tree that has not yet been cut down. May simple things. May simple things speak to us of your mercy. And tell us that life can be good. And may these sacramental gifts make us remember those who do not receive them, who have their lives cut every day in the bread absent from the table, in the door of the hospital, the prison, the welfare home that does not open, in sad children, feet without shoes, eyes without hope, in war hymns that glorify death, in yeah. deserts where once there was life. Christ was also sacrificed, and may we learn that we participate in the saving sacrifice of Christ when we participate in the suffering of his little ones. Amen. Amen. And may it be so as we listen and sing as you wish at home or where you are uh, to our closing hymn, O Thou Who This Mysterious Bread.
Amen. We now hear this benediction. Friends, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel our way. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the blessing and companionship of God the Almighty, the love and grace of Jesus Christ the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless y'all. Good to see everybody.